Good afternoon or evening. Um, hi, I'm glad actually to see some faces in the audience that I've not recalled from uh, our previous five lectures. So let me introduce myself. I'm Jacqueline Goldsby. I'm a professor of English. Thank you. <laughs> Those are my awesome students. Um, I'm a professor of English and African American Studies. I'm also chair of the African American Studies Department here at Yale. And I'm very lucky, actually, to be teaching the course that propels this lecture series forward, James Baldwin's American Scene. Um, this is this year's Frankie Seminar in the Humanities. And I want to thank, as I always do, Richard and Barbara Frankie for supporting this series, uh, for allowing us to think as broadly and deeply as we have been these last weeks, and for Again, I just can't tell you how much it means to all of us to be able to teach and learn at the scale that we do. So thank you, Mr. and Mrs. Frankie. I'm so glad you're here. A few other points. Um, as I mentioned, this is the fifth of six public lectures that are part of this series that accompanies the course. Uh, we have one more talk to come. We have a bit of a break. Um, the next talk will be uh, on Tuesday, December 6th. Chris LeBron, who teaches in African American Studies and Philosophy here at Yale, will talk to us about Baldwin's philosophy of love. That will be 5.30 here at the Whitney Center. But I'm going to uh, hazard a risk here and um, suggest that you save a date um, because it looks like we might be able to add a very special film screening to the calendar in November. We're hoping for November 17th um, to screen Raoul Peck's new film, I Am Not Your Negro, here um, at Yale. Uh, you might have been reading about this film, which has recently debuted at the Toronto Film Festival and the New York Film Festival as one of the most important after the price of the ticket, the Karen Thorson and Doug, uh, Doug, what is your last name? Dempsey, Dempsey thank you. Uh, brought to us and still remains central to our understanding of Baldwin. Um, this film will complement and extend their work in ways that I'm, I'm absolutely eager to see. Um, this movie, I Am Not Your Negro, is based on Baldwin's unfinished manuscript, Remember This House. Um, his meditation on the murders that, in Baldwin's words, devastated my universe. I'm talking about the murders of Medgar Evers, Malcolm X, and Martin Luther King. Um, Peck's film, as I mentioned, has debuted at the Toronto Film Festival, Festival and the New York Film Festival. Critics at the black film blog Shadow and Act call it a haunting, exceptional film. Uh, the New York the Times declared the film to be the must-see documentary of the season. So we're aiming for November 17th, um, probably around 6 o'clock. Uh, we will know for sure whether or not we're able to screen this. It looks like we can, but I'm hoping that will be the date. Uh, so check the Whitney Humanities Center's website and click on the link for this class, the James Baldwin's American Scene, and you'll know by next Friday if we're going forward with it. But it will be November 17th, probably 6 o'clock-ish. Um, it will probably be the only time that this film is shown in Connecticut. Otherwise, you'll have to go to New York to see it. So take advantage of that. And again, we have to thank Mr. and Mrs. Frankie for making that possible. Um, a couple other thanks I want to give, as always, to the Whitney Humanities Center staff, Gary Tomlinson, who's the director, the office staff, Sandra Malin Bowles, and as always, Tony Sudall, who's like got me wired up here for 21st Century Sound. He does amazing work for us, and I appreciate it. And also, uh, my graduate assistant, Phoenix Alexander, who really does attend to every single detail um, that makes the work of this painless. But now let me introduce our speaker. Our speaker today is Professor Magdalena Zabroska, who teaches in the Departments of American Culture and Afro-American and, Af and African Studies at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. She writes and teaches broadly and creatively across the span of 20th century American and African American literatures from a decidedly global lens, as hinted by the title of her first book, How We Found America, Reading Gender Through East European Immigrant Narratives, and the book that brings her to our series today, 
James Baldwin's Turkish Decade, Erotics of Exile. Sorry, I'm having to work around our computer here. That book, which justly won the Modern Language Association's William S. Scarborough Prize, awarded to the best book in African American Literary and Cultural Studies in 2008, charted a new, crucial direction in Baldwin studies. Let me briefly explain why. We know so much about Baldwin's famous rejection of the United States for Paris and when he left New York for that city in 1948. We also know quite a bit about his seven year stay that brought us such classic works as Go Tell It on the Mountain, Giovanni's Room, and the essay, The Stranger in the Village. James Baldwin's Turkish Decade expands the maps we've used to chart Baldwin's global career. In this stunning work, Professor Zabroska recovers the 10 year period between 1961 to 1971, when Baldwin's transatlantic commuting, to use his phrase, landed him in Istanbul, Turkey. There, Baldwin found a vital home space, or as he would put it, a place to dwell, where he experienced much needed peace, solace, community, and productivity. Detaching himself from the frenzied fame that defined his role as a leading public intellectual in the US civil rights movement, choosing to reject the seductions and corruptions of Western Europe's conceptions of race, gender, class, and power, Baldwin was able, in Istanbul, to explore his sensual self. This is a term that comes from his work, To Fire the Next Time, a term that I take and we've been discussing in class as a theory, as a concept about modeling open, reciprocal experience and acceptance. He's able to explore his sensual self in Istanbul. Put another way, and in important terms that Zabroska recovers, Baldwin embraced his same sex loving self in Istanbul. Indeed, his queer self appears more fully in his social relationships and in his writing from Istanbul. In this regard, Magda's book is more than a groundbreaking biography, which it is by any and all accounts. The book's equally impressive accomplishment stems from the way she traces what she calls the Turkish imprint on what critics have heretofore dismissed as Baldwin's late and supposedly less formally accomplished novels. Here, I refer to the works from another country, first published in 1962, to just above my head. James Baldwin's Turkish Decades restores those challenging, admittedly difficult, absolutely complex works back to Baldwin's canon as the experimental works they truly are. James Baldwin's Turkish Decade is, I hope you can appreciate, a deservedly award-winning book. I'm certain that Magda's forthcoming study, Me and My House, James Baldwin and Black Domesticity, forthcoming in 2017, awesome, will be groundbreaking in its own right too. Her talk today draws from that project, Erasure, Overlay, Manipulation, James Baldwin's Queer Dwellings. Please join me in welcoming Professor Magdalena Zabroska to Yale. Good evening, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Thank you. If I ever go low, please signal, especially people sitting in the back. Um, I want to thank Jackie for this lovely, generous introduction, and I'm really happy to be here, and I want to thank all the people whose names I cannot possibly remember and, um, and, and mention here for preparing my visit and for making it possible, and especially to Mr. and Mrs. Frankie for the series, of which I am so proudly a part of, also to Phoenix, who has taken care of me beautifully, uh, including dragging my bag and computer and books uh, to this place. Uh, in this talk, I will try to give you a sense of what my book um, talks about. And uh, very quickly, my archive is incredibly eclectic. So I look at salvaging books, objects, artwork left from Baldwin's house in Saint Paul de Vence in the south of France. And my concern is to really try to preserve the matter, the material traces of black life, because it matters, because we need this project of preserving and recovering these remnants. So I'm spinning three larger concepts here and they will circulate through the narrative of the talk. 
uh, the matter has to do with architecture, with physical environment, with objects, with how things really are part of our lives. The second part is the material or life story biography, what we make of Baldwin's life, his uh, various locations. And thirdly, the metaphor, I like alliterations, how Baldwin's writing reflects his domestic environment, the objects he interacted with, but also the stories people told about him, the stereotypes he had to encounter. And I want to begin with two quotations um, in addition to a song, which you will hear in a moment, that really locate Baldwin and his musings on his place in the nation, in the national house of the United States, if you will, and on the other hand, on being a very private, very domestic person as a writer, as a, as a queer black man. If I am a part of the American house, and I am, it is because my ancestors paid striving to make it my home, so unimaginable a price, and I have seen some of the effects of that passion everywhere I have been, all over this world. When home drops below the horizon, it rises in one's breast and acquires the overwhelming power of menaced love. Both of these from the wonderful 77 essay, Every Goodbye Ain't Gone. And now let's listen to a brief clip of Bessie Smith's Backwater Blues. When it rains five days in the sky, sun dark as night. When it rains five days in the sky, sun dark as night. Then trouble taking place in the lowlands at night. James Baldwin's 1961 interview with Stad Sterkel, recorded soon after the second collection of Baldwin's essays, Nobody Knows My Name, had been published, we hear about how the famous blues singer Bessie Smith became the young black writer's creative inspiration. Terkel begins their conversation by playing the opening bars of Smith's popular backwater blues, which floods the air with images and sounds of ceaseless rain and the singer's persona stranded in her house like a prisoner of the elements, waiting for a boat to rescue her. Cause my house fell down and I can't live there no more. Somewhat breathlessly, Baldwin explains how much Smith's blues and her way of performing them shaped his desire to be a writer. The first time I ever heard this record was in Europe and under very different circumstances than I had ever listened to Bessie in New York. And what struck me was that she was singing about a disaster which had almost killed her, and she accepted it and was going beyond it. It's a fantastic kind of understatement. It is the way I want to write. By the end of her song, Smith's persona has been rescued and left up on some high, old, lonesome hill, overlooking the water and her collapsing house. She sings about being stranded, along with thousands of people ain't got no place to go, but feeling all alone, shocked, and stuck. And here's another clip. Please forgive me. I have to move it up a bit. So we hear the part we need to hear. Somehow lonesome here. And I Thank you. 
Backwater blues, Dan called me to pack my things and go. Hmm, I can't move no more. Hmm, I can't move no more. There ain't no place for a poor old girl to go. Though she needs to flee, she is immobilized in grief and numbness. She is homeless, alone with her song, atop a hill, amid the flood. A somewhat similar scene, one illustrating how these blues images of lost home and desire for writing the way Smith sang stayed with Baldwin for decades, appears in his last novel, Just Above My Head, 1979, which takes place in Harlem, the American South, and Western Europe. Although narrated by a man who tells his brother's story, it features a complex black woman, Julia Miller, who is key to the book's several braided plot lines and, in my reading, embodies the story of the homeless and lonesome woman from Smith's Backwater Blues. A child preacher prodigy, Julia is so spoiled by her parents that she rules them. Her refusal to let her seriously ill mother see a doctor until it is too late costs the mother's life. Orphaned at 14, Julia is left alone with her cruel alcoholic father who rapes her and when she becomes pregnant beats her nearly to death. Like that of Bessie Smith's blues woman, Julia's disaster is of biblical proportions. Like the flood, it obliterates her home and almost kills her. Baldwin's descriptions illustrate Julia's tragedy with metaphors that echo Smith's lyrics. Home was not a place she wanted to go, but she had no place else to go. With all her heart, she wanted to flee. She could not move. She was sitting still, watching everything crumble and disappear. She had to move, and yet she waited. With all her heart, she wanted to flee. She could not move. She could not move, and yet she knew she must. Soon it would be too late. She would begin to die. Baldwin narrates Julia's tragedy through elegiac rewriting of Smith's lyrics, cadence, and imagery, and by means of other characters' tales about her. Like Smith's blues, Julia's story revolves around the tragic loss of home and her lone efforts to survive and heal the trauma of her childhood. Unlike Smith's persona, who ends up stranded at the end of the song, however, Julia does learn how to move and to go on. She travels away from the United States and forges domestic spaces wherever she can find peace and safety. In the end, having accepted her tragic origins, she finds herself at home and becomes a home to others in her community. Like Smith's blues woman, Julia confronts and combats her tragic erasure. Indeed, she writes herself beyond the disaster and into a new life. Standing at the core of Baldwin's last epic novel, Julia's story is among many throughout his oeuvre that offer moving, profound alternatives to traditional mid-20th century models of African-American domesticity, and of course, to stock images of white picket-fenced home in dominant American national culture. Little noted today, the majority of the writer's works engage two powerfully interlinked themes related to this complex subject. First, the necessity to survive away from one's home and difficult childhood, and second, the desire and passion to create alternative kinds of domesticity and modes of dwelling for black bodies that do not fit gender, sexual, familiar, religious, or social norms, rules, and designs. A powerful lens through which to read Baldwin's works and their complex biographical and autobiographical context today. These two themes overlay and transform the stories of erasure and loss of home and identity central to his oeuvre. These two domestic themes of survival of family origins and of creation of alternative dwellings gain particular ur urgency in Baldwin's later works that he wrote following his Turkish decade and having settled in the south of France. In If Bill Street Could Talk, The Devil Finds Work, Just Above My Head, The Evidence of Things Not Seen, and especially his last unpublished play, The Welcome Table, these gain particular agency. These later works engage in deeper and more complex genre experimentation than those he wrote prior to 1971, while also offering bolder autobiographic revelations concerning the circumstances of his personal pain and authorial anguish, reflections on his early childhood and family home, as well as the deep conflict with his stepfather that left lasting trauma. 
In that sense, like Bessie Smith's blues woman, they voice the centrality of the personal, always being political, of one's art and life, merging, overlapping, and creating new literary and literal entities. Baldwin's later works were gestated and written in his last and longest lasting house in Saint Paul de Vence in the south of France. The relative stability of this domestic abode allowed him to refer in more intimate detail to his coming of age as a young lower class artist in Harlem and Greenwich Village and to document his search for writing havens and modes of dwelling outside of his home country in the 1976 volume of essays on, of all things, cinema and popular culture, The Devil Finds Work. And such singular pieces as essays, Every Goodbye Ain't Gone, Notes on the House of Bondage, Freaks, and the American Ideal of Manhood, later retitled as Here Be Dragons, and To Crush the Serpent. Before that period, while living temporarily in France, Switzerland, Turkey, Puerto Rico, or England, Baldwin had tried to create dwellings, however transitory, that helped him to script a story that would accommodate both his complex authorial and private identities of what we might call the complexity of black queerness today. Of course, resistant to labels, Baldwin saw himself simply as a sum of his multiple strange selves as a black American man who loved some men and some women, as he proclaims in Sadat Pakai's 1973 Turkish film James Baldwin from another place. In the same film, he also mentions a curious sensation while talking about the discovery of his sexual difference during his youth. Baldwin emphasizes that he felt so profoundly alone, so marginalized and singled out as a black gay man in Harlem that it seemed as if he had no mother and no father, as if he had no antecedents. Filmed in 1970 by Sadat Pakai inside Baldwin's cozy writing studio in Istanbul, this statement links loneliness and homelessness as inevitable conditions for someone who is both black and queer and also an artist. Describing himself as an orphan with no ancestry is a symbolic act, of course. For Baldwin, this is his artist statement. And of course, the statement puts him in the same boat, so to speak, with Bessie Smith's homeless blues woman, while also anticipating the story of Julia Miller's loss and survival to come in just above my head. Baldwin's pairing of the two conditions, loneliness and homelessness, as inextricably connected to American black queerness and his own art as a writer, should not be taken lightly for it signals the painful process of becoming James Baldwin in the last century, the hard process of claiming one's identity no matter how different from what was and is accepted at home. The relevance of Baldwin's vision endures today as many of us who are considered other still find their processes of becoming or simply being like so, so hard and so painful. A singular genius and a complex and often baffling human being like so many of us. James Baldwin is now bearing the role of the larger than life ancestor and antecedent for the LGBTQAI communities. Indeed, it can be said that his works and vision have created a capacious home, a deeply literary man-woman blues for us all. In the next part of this presentation, I will talk briefly about Baldwin's queer dwellings in Switzerland and France as examples of his literal and literal manipulation of the concept of house and home in places where he lived and the books he wrote there. So first I will highlight quickly Baldwin's fraught relationship with the Swiss painter Lucien Happersberger, the love of his life, and their homemaking efforts in an alpine village where Baldwin finished his first novel, Go Tell It on the Mountain. Second, I will return to Che Baldwin in France, the writer's house, which by now has been partially demolished, but which nevertheless remains a destination for those yearning for material remnants of that particular writer's life. I conclude with a glimpse of black queer utopian dwelling depicted in Baldwin's last novel as an example of how he domesticated his manipulations of various spaces in his last novel. And as a transition, I would like you to look at 
um, video of Diane Warwick singing A House Is Not A Home. This was a record Baldwin had in his um, collection, and this is the video that is a very different take on House <laughs> A chair is still a chair Even when there's no one sitting there But a chair is not a home And a house is not a home When there's no one there To hold you tight And no one there You can kiss good night a room is still a room Even when there's nothing there but good So this is a transition, and you will see why an unhappy love story, an empty house, and a lover missing in a domestic space is the topic here. So part one, on top of the mountain. Baldwin's on and off relationship with Lucien Happersberger, the love of his life, began in Paris about 1949 and ended at Chez Baldwin, where Happersberger visited many times and where he stayed in the fall of 1987 until the writer's death taking care of his former lover's ravaged body as his nurse. Their story of unrequited love and unfulfilled black queer domestic desire on the part of Baldwin, and of betrayal but also persistent platonic love for Baldwin on the part of Happersberger, is an important addition to the larger cachet of stories mapping transnational American cultures, the stories in which longing for home as haven intersects with erotic desire, race and class with private and public social spaces, and African diasporic and West European histories. When Baldwin met Happersberger, it was soon after the stolen sheet incident, described vividly in his essay, Equal in Paris. This is what Happersberger tells me in an interview in 2007. All Americans were stars then in Paris in the 50s and I needed to learn English. He is a tall man with gray hair receding quite a bit now and a cheerful manner. Born in 1932, he is 75 and laughs loudly, recalling that he was 17 years old then, a young, naive kid who knew nothing of racism, Harlem, but who was very curious. When he ran into Baldwin, they had a drink and spoke French and then, perhaps without quite realizing what exactly he was doing, Lucien found himself the love of James's life, the role he could never fully embrace after the first couple of years. We shared drinks and eating when we could. We had some good friends who did some great cooking. He was in love with Baldwin, given his belief in what he now terms male homosexuality. Everything was natural in what we did, he tells me. All of this was new to me. I'm sorry, but... I accepted it completely, Baldwin's race, his homosexuality, that he was attracted to me. Baldwin was a difficult friend and a difficult lover. After about six months in Paris, he was simply unable to write, Hoppersberger explains. I didn't know what I was doing. I put him up there, in the chalet, he says, convinced that Jimmy would write better in the secluded mountain hovel of Loche le bain where his family had a cabin. In addition to securing the chalet, Lucien got some money from his father to help to pay their living expenses. The only thing he did not prepare for was his lover's shock upon arrival. As Baldwin writes in The Stranger in the Village, it did not occur to me, possibly because I am an American, that there could be people anywhere who had never seen a Negro. 
As Happersberger claims, he and Baldwin made three visits to the village between 1950 and 52. On their first trip, they took a hazardous two-day long backpacking trip to Chemin in the mountains. It was hard. Jimmy almost lost his life on a glacier, he recalls, and then makes sure I notice the relevance of the trip to the title of Baldwin's first novel. The mountain was there. When they walked up, the ice on the glacier, the sun was hitting Baldwin's face, and it was a biblical metaphor and experience that counted for both of them. Baldwin managed to finish Go Tell It only on their third visit in winter of 1952, when he also worked on the essay Stranger in the Village and began writing his first play, The Amen Corner. Lucien assures me that no matter how he felt about it, Baldwin had always beautiful contact with people there. He charmed them, danced with a woman who owned a bistro there. He knew who they were and he really got his work done. But in the writer's account in Stranger in the Village, the bistro's own owner's wife, quote, beamed with a pleasure far more genuine than my own, having informed Baldwin that the village Catholic Church's collections bought last year six or eight African natives, a custom that is repeated in many villages for the purpose of converting them to Christianity. The ignorance of the villagers incites Baldwin's musings on slavery and colonial history and his own situation in the West onto which I have been so strangely grafted. Inside the chalet, much in love during their early visit, James and Lucien successfully play house together as a very strange couple, as Happersberger jokingly states in Karen Thorson's documentary, The Price of the Ticket. Baldwin writes in Stranger in the Village that their isolation from the distractions they so loved in Paris was nearly complete. There is no movie house, no bank, no library, no theater, very few radios, one Jeep, one station wagon, and at the moment, one typewriter, mine, an invention which the woman next door to me here had never seen. Indeed, he apprehends his remoteness from the United States and other African Americans in terms of irreconcilable cultural difference and the simple fact of social and geographic space, or a dreadful abyss between the streets of this village and the streets of the city in which I was born. Amid the wintry landscape surrounded by white faces, Baldwin's typewriter, manuscript, and Bessie Smith and Fats Waller records are the only reminders of his American home. Yet it is precisely this remoteness that allows for a low-key household routine that guarantees that Jimmy can write all day while Lucien shops and cooks. In the evenings, they go out for walks and drinks, or, as Lucien recalls fondly, I take him out. Their cozy chalet is the first semblance of home Baldwin ever shared with a lover. Happersberger describes it as typical rustic with a little kitchen and main room with a stone oven. We were always sitting there. A little room next to it, very small. Under us, on the lower floor, there was a mother, unwed, with a child. A horror at that time. In Thorson's film, Happersberger remembers vividly the moment when the novel is finished one day. He is listening to Jimmy's punching out loudly its final six letters, the end. As Happersberger tells me in 2007, as if summing up the surprising conclusion of Baldwin's essay, Stranger in the Village, in Loche Le Ben, Baldwin could see what culture and knowledge could do, that these people, the villagers, are victims of their culture with their medieval custom of buying Africans for the Catholic Church. He repeats that Baldwin understood so well these little people as victims of their culture. Being there was a key moment for him. He saw how much he was a modern human being, and they were in the Middle Ages. Clearly, to Lucien, there was never any doubt that his black American lover was the intellectual and genius in the village, one who took measure of the little people around him who wrote them up and used them as literary material rather than being, at least in any way worth mentioning, sized up by them as a stranger. And we know from the discussion this afternoon there is a bit more complexity to the situation. At the end of our conversation, Happersberger is very sad and tells me that after Baldwin's passing, he realized that 
If he'd lived, I'd help him to go on. I must say I left Jimmy alone at that time. And that's why he was thinking of suicide at times. I think he had no hope for this world. He quickly reminds me, I was there the last months every day. And finally, he tells me how quietly Baldwin passed away. He was serene, someone was reading to him, he couldn't talk. We, Lucien and David Baldwin, James's younger brother and Bernard Hassel, sat with him, saw him and watched him go. He tells me in a low voice with a sad smile, then laughs a low choking laugh and drinks a toast. Part two, a house is not a home. I first walked through James Baldwin's former house on the edge of Saint Paul de Vence, an ancient town in the south of France in June of 2000, while having only the vaguest notion of how his works and life story would soon fill my own. Inside, the house was quiet, cool and shadowy, with the partially shattered windows letting in slender shafts of sunlight filled with dust motes. As I walked across the sunny stripes on the floor, the melancholy air of the place struck me. I was thinking of those whose home it once was, James Baldwin, his beloved younger brother David, who inherited the house after his passing, the beautiful dancer Bernard Hassel, who was their friend and house manager and died there of AIDS several years after Baldwin, and many others, famous or not, who came to visit and stay a while. It also made me think of those who once tended to its grounds, surfaces and objects, like Jean Foret, its previous owner and close friend of Baldwin's, or Valerie Sorel, who cooked splendid meals in their kitchen and served them to Jimmy and his guests at the table outside near an arbor. There must have been gardeners or groundskeepers too whose names and identities I would never know. But I recalled Mohammed, the Muslim groundskeeper from Baldwin's last play, The Welcome Table, who was based on an actual person. Of all the spaces, I was especially mesmerized by what was then, 13 years after Baldwin's death, left of his upstairs living room. Quiet, somewhat dusty, with hints of that omnipresent Mediterranean moisture that curled the photos tacked to the wall over the mantelpiece. That space beckoned for some inexplicable reason. To my literary critical imagination, that living room seemed to hold the most stories, memories, and traces of human habitation. At first glance, it appeared to be a simple enough space containing objects one would expect. A rustic wooden table and three chairs, a colorful orange-brownish pinkish throw, over the couch with puffy round pillows, maybe Turkish rug under the table, breaking the pattern of the checkered tile floor. On the walls there were photos, posters, and framed art, not to mention the storm of pictures and objects adorning the mantelpiece in the corner, which was dominated by a green-yellow-red Nelson Mandela poster. The longer I stood there, the more the room filled with possibility and wonder and yes, with desire and need. An important discovery I did not register in that moment, not until I came back to the house in 2014, was that I had been caught up in a powerful and collective Baldwin-related sensation that would travel through time and space. I was merely a predecessor to, or perhaps also appeared after, some others who had come and would continue coming to the site of Baldwin's house to find that material something which reading his works alone could not provide. Those of us who have been lucky and privileged enough to be able to make it to St. Paul de Vence are gripped by that same powerful need and longing to save something material from the site. All of us, scholars, intellectuals, writers, readers, and simply those who love Baldwin, are yearning to fulfill a dream of being somehow connected to the writer in ways that go beyond the literary magic that takes place on the pages of his text. On some level, perhaps we must all believe that the precious matter of that particular black life, which ended in that house in 1987, could somehow be salvaged and preserved, especially in light of so few remnants of his existence and the brutal absence of a writer's house museum devoted to him in this country. A few years ago, Baldwin great, Baldwin's great niece, Kalima Nazarene, traveled to the house and took haunting black and white pictures. 
Others, like Douglas Field, Thomas Chatterton Williams, and Rachel Kadzigensa, have written about the undeniable pull of this particular place, which compelled them to jump over fences, dig up pieces of china from the dirt, or search desperately for other remnants. In all of their accounts, this material hunger is palpable, as is the fervent imagining, or even inventing if necessary, of Baldwin's past and his possessions on the basis of available elusive evidence, hearsay, and yes, that thirsty desire to be close to him. Reading Baldwin, I think, makes one greedy for the matter related to his life, for we have nothing else left of him but his published works. Perhaps the preponderance of digitized photographs and recorded interviews with Baldwin online is only magnifying this yearning for objects, for the solidity of things whose weight and concrete endurance might afford us a connection with him that is more substantial, more intimate, more worked for than the impersonal touch of a keyboard or fleeting image on a screen. Indeed, what I have discovered is that Baldwin's last writing haven helps us to push the dyad of black queer further by giving it a socially spatial dimension and by modifying it with two terms that his work has commanded and inspired, domestic and transnational. The former term, domestic, arises from the literary focus of my project on Baldwin's black queer home spaces, from its architectural focus on a series of images of Baldwin's house in Saint Paul de Vence. The latter term, transnational, has to do with what some of his readers see as ironic and others as tragic, namely that the writer was unable to find a writing haven in his home country. Exiled from the United States, both by circumstance and choice, following his first foray into European exile in France and Turkey, Baldwin did find his most enduring home in the unlikely remote village of Saint Paul de Vence. That domestic space allowed for a nurturing routine that helped him to slow down in order to take better care of his ailing health and to remain productive as a writer, academic teacher, and transnational public intellectual who continued to travel but always returned home to his Provencal abode. As I mentioned, Baldwin died at home in Saint Paul de Vence in 1987, and Shea Baldwin was left to his younger brother, David. Following David's death and several lawsuits, the house was lost to developers in the early 2000s, emptied of the brothers' possessions and deserted, no matter James's dying wish to preserve it as a retreat for African diaspora writers. Today, there is no trace of the famous American writer's presence in the area, no sign, no marker, no photograph in the guidebooks. As of early November 2014, large parts of the structure were demolished, including the ground floor section facing the back garden that contained Baldwin's study and living quarters. Although a partial shell of the house still endures, it seems now as if James Baldwin, the famous African-American writer, has never set foot in Saint Paul de Vence. That there is no place in this country that, are, that one can visit to imagine Baldwin's writing life, to frame with material architecture and landscape the metaphorical, biographical, and literary knowledge we have of him today is deeply poignant at a time when the United States boasts of some 70 writers' houses that are museums open to the public. While documenting the process of the erasure of Baldwin's house, I also, I'm sorry, I also read into its destruction and emptiness and tease out from existing material evidence, Baldwin's works, letters, photographs of the structure and objects salvaged from it, and plenty of imaginative speculation. That unique overlay or traces of black queer domestic presence that Baldwin, the transnational African-American writer, and one of the most important literary figures of the last century has left us as his legacy. The author, whose works touch upon domestic themes with some regularity throughout his oeuvre, commented on the paradox of house and home 
as discourse, structure, and process in a short autobiographic essay published in, of all places, Architectural Digest in August of 87, just a couple of months before he died. A house is not a home. We have all heard the proverb. Yet, if the house is not a home, home, it can become only a space to be manipulated. Manipulation demanding rather more skill than grace. Appearing in print about three months before his death, this statement confirms the importance of his domestic abode to his late works and compels his readers and critics to engage in rigorous search for the sources and effects of the domestic manipulations that he implies in this little-known essay. Gaston Bachelard's literary critical formulation concerning our imaginary domain over places we inhabit links the house image to the topography of our intimate being. Shebold Win can thus be seen both as a physical space of manipulation for its owner, as Baldwin claims in the Architectural Digest piece, and as a space offering a visitor a chance to read their own versions of James Baldwin's dwelling, where, in the absence of any sites in this country, we can conjure up his black queer domesticity from whatever remains of his household abroad. Part three, black queer utopias. The loft stretches the entire length of the top floor, half-heartedly divided by a clothesline with a sheet draped over it. Behind this sheet is the bed, close to the floor, covered with a heavy dark blue blanket and many loud pillows. There is a bathroom and the rudiments of a kitchen. In the front are Arthur's piano, records, tape recording apparatus, sheet music, books. There is a sofa, chairs, a big table. On the walls, photographs and posters. The last pages of James Baldwin's sixth novel, his last, just above my head, glimpse a utopian domestic space occupied by two black men in love who are musicians in New York City. The older one is a singer named Arthur and the younger a pianist named Jimmy. As Ar I'm sorry, this, is, this should not be happening. <laughs> Forgive me, I have no idea why this happened. Uh, the older one is a singer named Arthur and the younger a pianist named Jimmy. As artistic collaborators as well as lovers, they have created a home together and the loft is where they live and work. For hours, days and months, the labor of music commands their time. It is their progeny, though it comes from the black church where openly black queer men are usually not welcomed. The rituals and sounds that have framed their childhood and young manhood in Harlem are now fodder for their creativity, work, and love. The space they occupy is both home and haven. It is the only place where they can be themselves, where their love not only dares to speak, but also sing, shout, and testify to its name. The interpenetration of artistic, domestic, and religious spaces in Jimmy and Arthur's utopian refuge in Just Above My Head echoes James Baldwin's own experience as a budding writer from a lower-class African-American family in the United States and his youth in the Pentecostal tradition of storefront Harlem churches. Written largely in his house in the south of France, his last novel also reflects the more expansive, meditative, and improvisational approach to fiction that he turned to in the 1970s and 80s. As the writer describes this work in the interview with Clayton Holloway given for the Xavier Review in November 1985, it arose from a series of short stories that made him realize that, quote, within the last 20 years, my attention has been on something which I cannot handle in a short story. I am involved with a big canvas, and that has been a very big challenge and a kind of terror. The challenges and gestation of his last novel required that Baldwin not only embrace new and to him terrifying approaches in his work, the approaches that his happy domesticity in the remote part of France certainly enabled, but that he also confront himself as an older artist who must, 
as he explains in the Xavier Review interview, conquer with a process that begins with apprehension, alienation, the sense of being other and therefore doomed, his work is his only hope. As the writer mentions in a letter written to his younger brother David on February 6, 1979, on the day he thought he had finished just above my head, he felt torn, haunted, and uncertain about this book. He was feeling that somehow he missed it, was not quite equal to the song that he heard and wanted to sing at the same time as he felt that he didn't cheat and that at the bottom of myself, he also thought that it was his very best book. Given the writer's tremendous investment in that last novel, it is no accident then that the two artist figures who occupy the utopian black queer home space in just above my head bear their author's first and second names. The room described in the epigraph contains furnishings that could have come from a room in Baldwin's own house. The colors are familiar too, resembling the palette of the author's French abode. Hall Montana, the narrator and author's elder brother, whose story begins with him imagining post factum his brother's death, has an epiphany regarding his situation as he's looking at the ceiling of his bedroom. The ceiling whose description fits exactly the one in Baldwin's house in Saint Paul de Vance, specifically in his no longer existing living quarters, whitewashed with heavy, exposed, unpainted beams. In that novel, Baldwin's French house becomes part of the physical setting, as well as making the writing of its plot and characters possible as the space of authorial labor. In the writing process, Material circumstances often follow metaphysical visions and vice versa. For the scene with the ceiling moving down just above the narrator's head in the novel was inspired by an actual dream that the writer had at his Shebaldwin bedroom in 1975. On the same night, his younger brother David, who was staying at the house too, dreamt of characters in search of an author. The brother's dreams the house and an old gospel song, up above my head, I hear music in the air, came together to make what Eleanor Trailer terms in her review as the story, both dreadful and beautiful, a tale told consistently by the Baldwin narrator witness. Quite fittingly, his last novel reveals Baldwin concerned more than ever with the familiar elements of his writing his own and his people's stories, past and present, that are often traumatic, but also increasingly with matters spiritual and esoteric, dreams, premonitions, revelations, allegories, and parables that should be seen as important, albeit underexplored, signatures of his late style and central to his last decade, filled with experimentation and play within and without African diasporic artistic forms. While that complexity and terror that it inevitably brought about in his writing process had been Baldwin's intense focus throughout his life, he insisted on making sexuality and especially male queer sexuality as important as the issues of race and class in his representations of black American subjectivity. Of all of his works, just above my head, deals with black queerness and sexuality in general most openly, daringly, at the same time as it makes clear the deep prejudice against same-sex desire in the community, country, and the wider world around Arthur and Jimmy. The domestication of their bond, however short-lived in the novel, also marks a turning point in 20th century American literary representations of blackness and queerness, one that academic theory has caught up to only fairly recently. As Patrick Johnson and May Henderson define the field of black queer studies that has claimed Baldwin as its literary ancestors for over a decade, I'm sorry, as its literary ancestor for over a decade, to queer queer to throw shade on its meaning in the spirit of extending, of extending its service to blackness. 
as they emphasize both, both terms, black and queer, are markers or signifiers of difference. So we endorse the double cross of affirming the inclusivity mobilized under the sign of queer while claiming the racial, historical, and cultural specificity attached to the marker black. That's a mouthful. As we all can see, I hope by now, Baldwin hit this theory decades earlier and explained it more in more compelling ways. To conclude, Baldwin's wondrous manipulations of black queer domesticity resulted from what many of his American critics and readers on both sides of the color line did not like at the time, or from his artistic desire to offer a more humane queer alternative to merciless Western narratives of the so-called progress and civilization. Baldwin does this work with gusto by writing strange blackness, himself and his personal story of homelessness and loneliness that black women writers first sang to him in their blues as a central corrective presence into the late 20th century narrative of American national identity. Baldwin's private black queer attempts at homemaking outside of the United States continue to resonate in his works with an urgent public task of rewriting both the story of Western colonial dominance and the story of the American national house from the brilliant, complex, and often painful, but absolutely necessary vantage point of African diaspora that he has made uniquely his own. Thank you. Thank you so much, Magda, for that wonderful talk. That was really wonderful. Um, so we have time for questions, um, comments, insights. Do you, do you want to be here? Sure. Okay. I, can, I have the mic. Oh, you, that's right. You do have that. Okay, great. I just have three physical questions. Where is that archive? Um, the different photos that were obviously in cardboard boxes and kind of stashed in an attic looking space. So, so the, um, I'm, I'm not allowed to talk about this person's identity, but she was involved with Baldwin's brother. And when the family lost the house to a lawsuit, they had less than 24 hours to empty the house, which contained all of Baldwin's books, all of his brother's artwork, all of the photos and files. For example, a whole box of files he used to research the evidence of things not seen, his last essay volume. All of this because it wasn't exactly manuscript, which is the, you know, the precious, in the economics of literary inheritance, this is the precious possession, right? This is the stuff that brings in money. So all of Baldwin's manuscripts, notes had been removed, but his library, his magazines, his journals that he read regularly, boxes of, of Xerox copies of various pieces of research he used for his work, they, they were left there. And they would have gone to the dumpster if this person hasn't basically paid her own money to save them and to store them. And I was lucky enough to meet her and obtain her permission to document them. And uh, it's very fortuitous we have um, archivists from the Beinecke here because perhaps there is a way to save some of this material. She's basically ready now to sort of get rid of it and, and make sure it finds a good home. So in a nutshell, that's the story. Other questions, comments? I'm struck by a quote by Baldwin when he says that um, you'd better take your home with you, otherwise you're homeless. And I wondered how you would relate that quote to what you, you're very eloquent perceptions. Thank you. That's, that's a quote that's in your documentary. This is Karen Thorson, the director of the documentary, The Price of the Ticket. And um, this, this is an amazing, one of those things to put on a t-shirt, on a hashtag, you take your home with you. So who you are, who you were born with. We had a great discussion. The students present here made fantastic comments on that very theme in, in the class today. You take who you are with you, your roots, even the trauma, even the pain of your origins comes with you. You cannot shed it, you cannot get rid of it. And of course, in American 
cultural narratives, of, you think of immigrant narratives, you're supposed to go through a melting and shed your identity and become a new entity. And that happens to, to a degree, but you never really lose who you are. I think there is a layering, reformulating, recreating, manipulating indeed, overlaying of all these selves and histories and stories. So, so yes, um, it's your decision to be homeless or to be perceived as homeless. And I think homelessness really makes the importance of memory, of being uprooted, of having a geographic place. We are all accidents of genetics and geography, right? But we all can trace our beginnings to a certain place and certain people. I have a question. Um, it was really helpful moving through the talk to have you um, explain the, your own architecture of the argument by way of the three terms, erasure, overlay, manipulation, right? And I'm wondering, could you say a little bit more about how you see them as a part of what kind of building system to continue the conceit? Do you see them as discrete operations in Baldwin's, uh, especially thinking about the late novels after 71, the writing after 71? which I would agree gets even more expansive than 62 to 70 or, or so. Um, but do you see erasure, overlay, manipulation as distinct elements of a system, or how do, how do you envision them interacting? Because it was a neat way to kind of schematize the talk. But I was wondering, as a system, as a theory of an architecture for the novel, because that's in some level what you're building towards, it seems to me. Um, how do you see those, those uh, concepts relating to one another? I think they exist simultaneously, and this is where you see Baldwin juggling multiple elements of identity. You know, we talk about intersectionality, and we get there somewhere in the 90s in academic discussions and theories. But he's very much aware of it as he constructs his artistic vision and changes and amends it. So the sense of erasure, and, and again, the matter of black lives, there has been some preservation of it, and I'm speaking of it having been recently to the soft opening of the new National Museum of African American History and Culture. But then there is also so little that is preserved. There is so much that is lost. And for him, as one of the most important writers of the last century, not only in this country, but, but throughout the world, it is painful to see how he touched so many places, and yet we can find more traces of his presence in Turkey than in the United States. So that sense of erasure, of material remnants, of traces, of imprints of black life is one of the issues that he talks about and that I'm very much at work in the work, mm -hmm. in the work mm -hmm. that I'm doing. The overlap is that creativity, is that desire to save it and to do something with it. And in that sense, Baldwin realizes that like his stay in Turkey, his stay in France in his late life brought new qualities, brought new ways of seeing to him. So then what he considers his past and his story gets overlaid with new entities, with new quantities and qualities. And then finally, the manipulation is that amazing genius he has of spinning all these things together into literature. So just above my head, I know the students are heading towards that novel, so if I may give any of it away right now, is that people hated this novel because they didn't know how to read it. Mm -hmm. And yet, if you think through all these things and Baldwin spinning multiple themes, and again, think of the songs and the women singing the songs and the glamour, but also the pain and, and the form used to convey the pain, you begin to see a very careful design mm -hmm to all this sort of seeming jazz improvisation. That's how people kind of dismiss just above my head. It's a jazz improvisation. But what about it? How does it come about? And, and of course, you know, the obsessive compulsive academic uh, thing that we do in our work. I've worked with this novel so intensely and so closely that um, uh, I, I see it all, uh, but it's taken me, you know, at least 10 readings, very close readings of it to get there. So. To sum it up, what Baldwin asks of us, what Baldwin asks of himself and, and delivers so incredibly, is this really hard work. It's really labor, labor of reading, but also labor of understanding people. 
of seeing them, of listening to them, of seeing each person for who she, it, they are. It's, it's an incredible humanistic project that I think um, is something that we need, desperately need today. I mean, I don't have to tell you all right how much we need it today. Um, those pictures you showed from 2000 to 2014, I think they were mainly yours. It was very poignant to see literally the erasure of his home. And there was one I remember particularly, you had the ceiling, it was kind of ornate, yes. and then it was just gone, it was white. Um, you know, he, he's not Zola or Balzac, but did the French government ever express any interest in stopping this or preserving this? Uh, unfortunately, not until this time. Uh, now there is a foundation, and if you go to the, well, Dr. Google, his, his house in Provence, uh, the, the organization is not able to use Baldwin's name. His house in Provence is, is a budding foundation movement by some activists who are trying to save what remains of the house. So what they managed to do, somebody occupied the house for a while, then they had to be removed by police. Now the French government at least halted the destruction, uh, but the developer who owns the property, it's, it's a very expensive property by now, wants to put villas and swimming pools there to, you know, to make a lot of money. It's, it's one of those prime real estate pieces, uh, you know, most expensive um, in the region. So the economics of it on the one hand and on the other, the cultural imperative to preserve and to save are not exactly um, working hand in hand. So we'll see what happens. I, I have a sense though that it will take a while and again, I'm not sure if they would even want Baldwin's books. Mm. Again, the material I was showing you, mm. the boxes and boxes of the kind of objects that we don't value usually. Mm. Uh, that's, that's what I'm concerned with. That, that's the last traces we have of Baldwin. Curious, can I follow up on that? I mean, because you, you had a number of photographs of the books which were immensely interesting, so I take it those came from Baldwin's library. Yes, all yeah. of them. And did you get a chance to look at, the, are, are, is there marginalia in them? Are there traces of his engagement with those texts? I haven't had a chance to look through every book and every mm -hmm. page, mm -hmm. so there may be things I have not mm -hmm. seen. Mm -hmm. I saw a lot of the Xerox material that he worked with, and clearly mm -hmm. somebody was doing research for him because there were some notes from other people. Mm -hmm. um, all the manuscripts, letters, I, I found maybe one letter from a publisher and some manuscripts people sent him to read and comment on. But all the sort of stuff bearing heavy imprint of Baldwin's yeah. writing was yeah. removed. But I have not. I'm going back actually this uh, this next summer to mm -hmm. to do the rest of the research. That is hopefully to go through every book and yeah. see what what I can find yeah. inside them. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because it calls to mind um, Gwendolyn Brooks's papers. There's a cache of them at UC Berkeley, and of the 13 or so boxes, there's one box. Uh, that, that was labeled uh, in the finding aid, uh, greeting cards. So you look in these greeting, you know, you look in this box and there's, you know, folder after folder of like Hallmark greeting cards from Gwendolyn Brooks, right? One of the major amazing poets of the 20th century is buying and using Hallmark greeting cards. Okay. Um, and you could, you could just look at that and, and maybe the evidence you could get from it would be, you know, who is she writing to, who constitutes her social network, on the other hand, it also gives us a clue into her rapport with mass culture, right? That she wasn't above buying a Hallmark card to communicate, to connect with the people that counted in her life. And so having those material, that material evidence of how writers lived, and especially how black writers lived, I think is terrifically important, if I just may say yes. and comment on that, because it's just, you know, I get envious, frankly, of, of jazz, historians who have this extraordinary set of archives that document the jazz creative process, from the composition charts to the photographs of studio sessions, the photographs of concerts. You know, it seems like there's not enough, but a good body of autobiographical memoirs that we can turn to now, and this is one reason why jazz studies is thriving in African-American and American studies. I'm happy for that. I'm also jealous of it. 
um, as a literary critic I precisely am because, with you. especially for the mid-century authors. Um, that well, we have a phone log from Baldwin's house, so we have a, a record of really? several weeks of calls and who called, and among them there is one from Karen to talk about the film. And yeah, and, and there are calls from David Leeming, the biographer, and Maya Angelou. So, you, you know, you can find the sort of record of everyday life, again, that we don't necessarily pay attention to, but as you said, gives yeah. us proof of that lives, of the mundane, and the importance of the mundane to yeah. that life. Yeah. Any other comments or questions? Just when you were speaking about whether somebody might want the books or not, as, as you see what happens, as we all see what happens with the house and government and so forth, we have a friend that works in the U.S. with the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And we were hearing about a Louis Armstrong house, and what was interesting mm -hmm. is it was just a preservation of domesticity. Here's where he kept his medicine, and it really, the whole, yeah, the whole idea was this sense of, how a person lived, and part of the stunning aspect is a, a, a kind of a nondescript place, and here are the objects around him, and what you consider this genius, this magic, it's a person who works every day, and it's very inspiring to see that. I can imagine those books being incredibly important, especially a writer who would visit and say, right. oh, this is just the way I work, all this stuff lying around, and it's simmering and percolating, and starts to inform my work. I think it's tremendously valuable. I understand the manuscripts are yes. high-priced items that travel around like a painting and we or somebody. Need those, obviously but they this are. other stuff is that's how it got made. And and I tell you, I mean, I opened a box and there were there was every novel by Edith Wharton and I thought, "Oh my gosh. Every one double copies of some of them." There was Alice Walker, there was Toni yeah. Morrison's yeah. Beloved, which yeah. he started yeah. reading, didn't finish. He yeah. wanted to finish before yeah. he died, he didn't get to it. Yeah. There were books, there were black Christian gay magazines about whose existence I never knew. Uh, uh, several issues of them. Mm. There was, of course, Black Scholar, but there was also Ebony, there was Jet Magazine. There mm. were very popular culture mm -hmm. items as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, books about France and Provence and tour guides, but also history volumes, but also books on costumes in Africa and the Caribbean. Uh, incredibly sort of interesting reading range. And, and that really was very valuable to me because it confirmed what I was told by so many of Baldwin's friends, that he read everything. Please remember, the man never went to college. He finished his education at the, the Wood Clinton High School in, in the Bronx. That was it. And yet he, uh, he was so autodidactic and so devoted to world literature that he devoured everything that got written. So he read the theory, he, but he also, you know, he read Dostoevsky, he cut his teeth on Dickens as a small kid, and he was able to turn, remember Dickens, not exactly friendly to black people writer, he is able to turn Dickens's descriptions of poverty, of children, mm -hmm. of misery, of pain, into valuable material for mm -hmm. his mm -hmm. future mm -hmm. um, craft. So mm -hmm. I think exactly those mundane, often neglected objects, reading material, are actually key to getting a full picture, to getting a full portrait mm -hmm. of the artist. Mm -hmm. Okay, any more? The last thought. Well, thank you so much, Matt. Thank you for coming and for being a great audience. Thank you. Thank you.